Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Actor Jussie Smollett is reindicted, and Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox's political opponents take aim. Every time that Ms. Fox has said, we treated him the same as everybody else, or the only thing we got wrong is transparency, is frankly that was a lie. But Fox does notch a win when a judge rules she can use taxpayer money to pay for outside lawyers. Representing her as the special prosecutor investigates her handling of the Smollett case. A short list for Chicago's new police superintendent appears to be taking shape. This as Mayor Lightfoot calls on police leaders to get a handle on crime after an unusually violent weekend. There remains no need for the general public to change their behavior in any way at this point. No need to wear masks in public. No need to cancel events. And certainly no need to avoid coming to Chinatown. But Chinatown business owners say they're still seeing a huge slowdown of customers. And in sports, the All-Star Game comes to town for the first time since 1988. Joining us are Greg Pratt of the Chicago Tribune. A.D. Quigg of Crane's Chicago Business, Megan Crapo also of the Chicago Tribune, and Mike Mulligan of 670 The Score. So let's dig right into the top stories of the weekend of the day. A lot of news breaking today, but uh, Megan Crapo, uh, Dan Webb, the special prosecutor in the Smollett case, six new charges against Mr. Smollett. Will this be the last that we hear of Mr. Webb? Oh, I don't think so, because don't forget, his mandate is to not only figure out whether Smollett deserved to be charged again, but also to look into whether Kim Fox's office and any entity that touched the Smollett investigation, you know, whether there were any shenanigans there. And that aspect of his investigation is still ongoing. And remind us um, why Mr. Smollett can be charged with the same crimes twice, essentially, and not face uh, d some kind of double jeopardy protection? Well, double jeopardy is pretty commonly misunderstood. You actually, uh, those protections don't kick in until a trial has begun or you've pleaded guilty. And Smollett didn't do either of that. Even if he had, there's a solid argument that uh, he could still be charged again because the judge who appointed the special prosecutor basically said the entire first prosecution was void from the beginning, invalid, starting all over. So, so these six new charges are, are for the same alleged crimes that, that he had committed uh, before. Uh, Greg Pratt, Megan, says that Kim Fox is under scrutiny here. Dan Webb is saying, well, we don't agree with her office dropping those 16 charges that she brought, but we don't have evidence of wrongdoing yet. What do you make of that? Well, I wonder first, you know, the, the Fox campaign in their initial response to the charges was to accuse Webb of being like Jim Comey with the Trump investigation and the Hillary Clinton email stuff. Um, I wonder if he was actually trying to avoid that by leaving his determination out completely and, mm -hmm. and say, I can deal with that later. So we, to avoid the political reaction that's that's happened. Yeah, I think I think because it's one thing to say Smollett should have been indicted uh, as he was, and and the charges are valid, and we should go forward. And it's another to come back and say, well, Kim Fox did X because of Y, and her buddy Z called her up. So I think uh, I don't know that you would read too much into that, but that's something you could figure out. Maybe quick, what Webb said about Kim Fox was there was no new evidence that came to light against Mr. Smollett between the time they charged him with those 16 crimes and the tri time they just sort of dropped the charges. Right, basically that they didn't get enough documentation to show why they should have dropped those charges and there was no similar case that they could compare it to. And, and basically, right, she, the Fox office is saying, well, we do this all the time for these kinds of cases, but Webb says, well, where's the documentation? The office couldn't provide any. That's right, and they were very public about that when this sort of blew up, when everyone was questioning, why did you drop this? What happened here? They said, well, we do this all the time. And everyone kept asking, okay, give us an example, and they couldn't really find anything that was exactly analogous. This guy, this guy embarrassed Chicago, right? And it became a national story. But really, like, are we afraid? What's he going to do, mug himself again? Like, it just is a weird story. It's a lot of money wasted. Why not make the guy give restitution and, and move on? Do you, I, I don't do you think that this story is getting too much airtime in the local media? Yeah, I think it's getting tons of airtime. Now, you know, Kim Fox should never have taken that phone call. You know, you get on the phone with someone. This is a phone call that, from Tina Chen, exactly. who is the, fir the first lady, Michelle Obama's so chief of staff. Who, who cares what anyone else thinks about it, right? She should make her own decision, and she should not be discussing a case with anyone. But this is a really 
ultimately, when you think about our city and the issues and last weekend, this is really a dumb story. And you have uh, the candidates for state's attorney in the Democratic primary pouncing. Right. Um, is Kim Fox damaged by any of these new indictments? We have been hearing about Jesse Smollett for a year now. Basically, I think both sides think uh, you formed your opinion on Jesse Smollett if you're a voter in Cook County. Um, the reminder doesn't help, but it has damaged her over this past year. And Greg Pratt, even today, Senator Tammy Duckworth is endorsing Kim Fox. She's got endorsements from presidential candidates Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. If more comes out about Kim Fox's handling of this case, might they regret those endorsements? Well, they might, but I, I don't think they ever will because an endorsement is about all sorts of other things that have nothing to do with whether you're going to win. It's about saying, I back you, I back this, I back these principles. Um, but she's in a lot of trouble. She is in a lot of political trouble, and she may not survive. She may, but, uh, but she's in real trouble, and those endorsements don't paper that over. Clearly, though, the case that she makes is that she has made good on her promises. She's expunged records. She's gotten rid of low-level uh, offenders from prison. I mean, is that a strong case to run on? Oh, well, listen, she basically is saying there is so much else on my record that you can look at besides the small it matter. You know, this is a blip, and she's said without really specifying why, but she's said she's mishandled it, right? But hey, look at all of the, uh, look at all the gun crimes we're prosecuting, look at all the low-level crimes that we're diverting. I mean, that, that's, that's the... And, and today she actually won a court case or, or a, a, like an argument where she can have outside counsel assist her on this on the taxpayer dime. Why is that? Well, that, I think that was to be expected. It's actually very common for the state's attorney's office to farm out certain matters to private attorneys on the taxpayer dime, uh, civil actions in particular. So that was, uh, I, you can consider it a victory, yes, but I think it was expected. Mike Mulligan, you, I mean, this is, you think this is overplayed in the media. Do you think voters are, are thinking about this right now, saying, I got to vote for her opponents because this Smollett thing stinks? You know, I think it does damage her for sure, and I think voters will take a look at it. But I think that, that her base, you know, she's the only African-American candidate, if I'm not mistaken, and I think her base will support her. And I think that it's going to be interesting to see you know, who else is running and how much money are you spending? I mean, it seems like... Five million dollars. <laughs> yeah, this is from Bill great, Conway. Right. Mm -hmm. of, this is one of the opponents. most expensive state's attorney's races we're ever going to see. We have Bill Conway, whose father, uh, William Conway, founder of the Carlisle Group, has dropped $7.5 million into his campaign. Wow. Into his son's campaign. Into his son's campaign. Um, Kim Fox is now getting outside support from a George Soros-backed super PAC that has been active in a lot of district attorney races statewide uh, and around the country. This is arguably as competitive as any other race in the state. There's a lot at stake here. I think it's a, uh, it might be more that he's got on his campaign fund than what the mayoral candidates ended up having. Maybe not daily, but it was, it was, a, it's interesting. We, me and uh, my colleague Lolly Bowen did a story looking at the uh, dynamics underneath the smaller thing and what it represents. And to her base, you know, and to a lot of African Americans and brown people in, in this town, it's not even, it doesn't register, it doesn't they, don't, register. they don't care. Right. Because they, they see the good things that she's done from their perspective. And so uh, that's a real dynamic too. Megan Cripeau also today, new state charges against R. Kelly. What are these charges? Uh, federal charges, sorry. Oh, they're federal charges, right. I'm sorry. Yes, so these are federal prosecutors in Chicago who filed uh, additional charges in an indictment that was, well, it came down in July. Um, they are alleging, uh, a new victim, a new underage person that R. Kelly sexually abused from 1997 to about 2000. He's in, in, in a heap of, of legal trouble, R. Kelly. Um, also today, the New York Times is reporting that uh, President Trump wants to send, quote-unquote, SWAT teams of immigration agents to help out ICE officials here. Mayor Lightfoot says we're not going to be bullied. What, what, does anyone know any more about what these agents are going to do? No, there's a lot of... There is a lot of uncertainty about that. And one of the weird things about Trump is, I mean, he's, he's intimated and he's suggested publicly and his administration has floated that they're going to do all sorts of stuff in the past, like the massive raids that just never materialize. So I'm not, I'm not sure what to make of this. And he's sending them to sanctuary cities, so-called sanctuary cities like Chicago. Does it change anything or does Chicago's sanctuary status protect undocumented immigrants from, from any federal agents? Well, they can't really, uh, the city can't stop an ICE agent from going somewhere. They can just stop, they can just make sure they don't help them. So that part doesn't change as much. But what the mayor is saying is, 
uh, we're going to redouble our efforts to, to make sure people know their rights. You know, she put out a video talking about their rights, which is you, you don't have to open the door unless they have a warrant and things of that sort. It's All just right. another opportunity for the mayor to basically punch back against Trump. This is something they both love to do. He loves going after sanctuary cities. She loves going after Trump. It, it, it helps his base when he does this, and it helps her base when she comes out against that. Let's move on to some city and county news this week. The shortlist for Chicago's new top cop reportedly is taking shape. A longtime aide to Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle barred from her county offices after a sexual harassment claim. And CPS's troubles continue as a Sen High School teacher is removed for an alleged racist claim classroom remark and Lincoln Park High School parent files suit against the Board of Education in that ongoing case. Greg Pratt, you did a story this week uh, citing sources uh, telling you about the short list for the new su CPD superintendent. What should Chicagoans know about this list? I think it's a pretty impressive and dynamic list actually. So you have and you have a wide range of of people. There's uh, a tech guy who's a reform guy, Sean Malinowski, who has close ties to the current interim superintendent. He was Charlie his deputy Beck. in LA and he's he's back here working at the crime lab. Yep. And then you have uh, Aurora Police Chief Kristen Zeman, who is a very eloquent writer, very uh, passionate about officer safety, handled, uh, in a lot of people's opinion, the Aurora mass shooting pretty well. Um, she, you have uh, David Brown, the former police chief of Dallas, who has a uh, big city experience. And then you have um, Cato. Ernest Cato, who is from within the CPD. Yeah, who is a real, you know, there's there's people overlooking him, but he is a real rising star. I was surprised there's a name not on there that a lot of aldermen told me about. Um, and that's Barbara West, who is in charge of, uh, the com I'm sorry, constitutional policing. She, she got promoted by Charlie Beck. Why isn't she on that list? You should beware what aldermen say in general, <laughs> but uh, it's a good question. She might not have even applied. You know, there, right. there, she is. Some a, people might not want this job. She is a high ranking person, but uh, why she's not on there, you know, could be a lot of And reasons. of course, what they have to deal with is, is a rising crime rate again. We had a violent January, violent February. Uh, is it time to get alarmed again or too soon to to really look into these oh, numbers? I, I don't I mean, I don't understand how you can't be alarmed if, if what happened last weekend, right? That was a record from back God knows how long if for February weekend now, you know, are we going to just keep relying on the cold weather to stop this? It, it doesn't seem and I know the mayor brought people in and said, let's all be proactive about this. But I think it's difficult for police to be proactive these days, generally speaking, they're, they're afraid. Charlie Beck actually used that as one of the reasons last January was really cold, this January mild. Previous superintendent said, oh, it has nothing to do with the weather, but he's admitting admitting that it does. As uh, Mike mentioned, the, the mayor called top brass in for this accountability, accountability meeting. Back. So what goes on in those meetings? Everyone is held to task and asked what they're going to do to address the next weekend. Um, this is something we we remember this summer, it was a nice opportunity to figure out exactly what the Chicago Police Department was doing week in, week out. Um, part of what we're all going to be watching is this reorganization of the force under Beck. He created two different offices, this constitutional policing office that Barbara West is in charge of, and this new operations uh, scenario that's going to play out over the next few months or so. Beck says this is best practice and this will go a long way in solving crimes. We're going to have more detectives on the street, more people out investigating, but it's it's going to take a while to figure out if this works. The way um, Cook County Board President Tony Prickwinkle handled the latest sexual harassment claim of a staffer, was that best practices? She says so. The IG says so. Um, this is Al Kindle, a longtime political aide to Prickwinkle. Um, I found out about this from an IG report where someone alleged that two people came forward with a complaint and that the president's office did nothing to handle it. The IG found out that actually there was mandatory reporting. The president supported the victim. Um, Al Kindle was suspended for five days and is now barred from entering the president's offices. This is notable because Preckwinkle's last close political aide, uh, um, John Keller, John Keller was also ousted. After and she was criticized for the way she, she handled was, that because she had been alerted six months prior to the allegation coming to light that something had happened and that she hadn't fully investigated it. All right, let's talk about the ongoing situation at Lincoln Park High School. A lawsuit now from parents against the Board of Education. Chaos over there, allegations of big time sexual harassment, investigations. How is this going to get resolved? Well, you know, they finally had a meeting where they talked to the parents. You know, there were a lot of parents that didn't understand exactly what was going on. And I think that there's more 
clarity to what was happening and what has happened. And, you know, when I first started hearing about it from a sports perspective, it was like, why aren't they letting the basketball team play? Right, they How suspended can they... the season for the boys' and, varsity and, basketball you know, it was, team. It affects college. What are these kids going to do? Is that fair to the students? And the rest of the stuff wasn't really out yet, and it's been leaking out slowly, and, and hopefully – now they're going to be more transparent in their dealings. But don't with they the have to keep some of that secret if these are sensitive investigations? How has the, the Board of Education handled this, you think? Oh, my God. I mean, I don't know how you handle so much coming at you at once. I mean, this is massive. And obviously, you know, this is also a demographic at Lincoln Park High School that knows how to get media attention, that knows how to play to, you know, that kind of audience. And so they're going to be doing this under a microscope. And there's lots of protests happening. Parents are angry. Um, Sen High School is also having some problems. Um, what happened at Sen High School to get uh, an administrator there in trouble? Well, a teacher told somebody, go back to your country, which is a big no-no in polite society anymore. This was, yeah, you know? this was a student mm -hmm. refusing to stand up during the pledge to kind of uh, protest the the district's treatment and approach toward so they didn't want to stand up for the policy. pledge of allegiance and the right. teacher said to an hispanic student which is you know not cool and what's allegedly and that teacher is suspended fired what's going to happen to that teacher i think they're just suspended pending the investigation because i think they're, they're, they're still figuring out the facts all right let's move on to some other local news the massive 78 development gets a huge infusion of cash from the state Presidential hopeful Michael Bloomberg expands his presence in Illinois, and health officials continue to warn against the coronavirus panic. A.D. Quigg, um, why did Governor Pritzker uh, authorize this $500 million now that was actually pledged under the former governor, Governor Rauner, for this tech center at that 78 development? This is part of a series of investments in schools statewide, and this is very good news for the developer of the 78 who needed an anchor tenant to really get this area going. Um, I like how we're all calling it the 78 when we've been calling it Rescoville for a very long time. Tony Resco used to own right? part of that property. And it's just been undevelopable for a very long time. So the, the developers of this having someone anchored there with financing is a good sign. And the next steps are getting infrastructure going. With all the priorities and fiscal challenges of the state, why is it just readily spending $500 million on that? I mean, it's an investment in the state's tech community. It hopes to be an incubator for other uh, businesses in the area. Um, it's, it's a big investment in universities after a tough budget crunch where universities really got hit. And part of, part of uh, a good way for the city and the state to solve their fiscal challenges is to grow. And you could grow, uh, you know, they, they want to build a, new, a whole new neighborhood there. So in theory, that's, that's good there, too. At least that would be the thinking. I'm very interested to see if that name actually catches on, by yeah. the way. This yeah. is Chicago. We're still calling it the Sears Tower. We're still calling it Marshall <laughs> Fields. I'm not going to call it the 78. You're not going to call it? What are you going to call it? Rescoville. Resco it's a better name. Rescoville is a catchy <laughs> name, I guess. Well, so the 78, because it would be the 78th neighborhood in Chicago. There's right. 77 community areas uh, at this point. Mike Mulligan, are you, uh, are you getting tired of all the Mike Bloomberg ads on the air now it seems to be that that's the only Democratic candidate spending money on advertising at this point well, you know, we in a state like Illinois. We're talking about uh, you know a city election where where a, a county election where you got all this money being spent. This guy has spent a small fortune. We should all be blessed enough to have enough money to cover his Super Bowl ad. That, that is insane, the amount of money he's spending. I'm going to be very curious to see what happens when he finally kind of jumps in. When you get to Super Tuesday and you get to states, he's setting up office here, you know, places that actually have real impact on an election. How is he going to do? I've got friends that, that like the guy. So I was a little surprised by that. How honest. damaged is he going to be? I mean, revelations this week from some of his racial comments, stop and frisk saying that whites are not, uh, that are, sto are stopped and frisked too much, very controversial comment, and his support of the tactic known as redlining, is money going to buy his way out of that? Uh, good chance, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, for, first of all, we live in a really so uh, forgiving society in general, which does explain part of what Trump does. Um, Although Trump Trump will fake apologize every once in a while, maybe Trump's not the best example. Uh, although I haven't he seen him apologize much. <laughs> he apologized for the Access Hollywood comments, you know, mm -hmm. for instance. But but in general, we live in a forgiving society, and politicians do things and they say I'm sorry, and people forgive. And he well, and he's he got buys the support a lot of, of people will. like Congressman Bobby Rush, uh, other um, African American ministers saying, you know, the past is the past. He he's atoning for it. 
whatever, whatever that means. Um, the people who tend to be forgiving him t also tend to be the people who he's given a lot of money to yes. in the past, 100%. Right. in the very recent past. Is that so when we, we talk about, when we talk about forgiveness, let's just keep that in mind. Yeah. And he might get Mayor Lightfoot's endorsement. Do you think that that's a shoe in? I don't know that that's a shoe in, but that's clearly somebody she's looking at pretty seriously. Big city, big city mayors, they have yeah. that in common and they've met quite a few times. What about Mayor Pete? Just not a big enough city? <laughs> What is South Bend, about 100,000? Exactly. Yeah. I'm proud South Bend native. We're just over 100,000. I think that's, uh, you know, that's a small city, and I think, you know, she might think... Uh, big heart. Small city with a big heart. <laughs> is that his official motto? No, I wish. Okay. We could, we well, could you probably should, you use should, a good motto like that. You should like brand that. that one. He's a bit of a whippersnapper, you know. I, I wonder how that holds for the mayor, but we'll see. Megan Kripo, are you confident uh, when Chicago health officials come out and say the risk of contracting coronavirus here is almost nothing given the pandemic in China. I think China is a very, very long ways away. I think we all should just be washing our hands and getting our flu shots, and I think we're good. And a lot of people are, are using this fear to avoid going to Chinatown, even though there's no, um, no reported cases of anyone anywhere near Chinatown. Is this a is this case of xenophobia? Is this a case of uh, just, just being too cautious? I think it's just people being cautious, and that's kind of sad. I was out there for the Chinese New Year, and the parade was really low, considering what it usually is. Mike, you going to head out to Chinatown, or is this coronavirus you know, scare uh, I, keeping I, you away? I used to go to Chinatown a lot, but now I, you know, kind of, I'm in a higher rent district, and I'm, I'm eating at better spots. To be honest <laughs> with you. It's a long way from the from the North Shore, Chinatown. It's a long drive. <laughs> All right, let's move on to sports. The NBA's All-Star Game hits Chicago for the first time in more than 30 years. And it might be in the single digits here, but Cubs and White Sox players are gearing up for spring training in Arizona with the team's first full squad workout scheduled for Monday. Mike Mulligan, how important is it to Chicago to be able to host the All-Star Game? Is there an economic boost to this? Well, I, I think we have professional basketball back in town. So that's one thing to think about, how bad the Bulls have been. <laughs> I forgot we, we, we had a team exactly, here. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, there is, there is not the same kind of economic impact. There will be some. This weather doesn't help, obviously, but there are big parties that are planned. You know, Michael Jordan throws a party at every All-Star game. You guys, make sure you get an invite. It's supposed I didn't to be get an invite quite to that spectacular. one. Yeah, I think it's a tough sell. I was walking down Michigan Avenue today, and I saw a guy walk out of, the, of a hotel, and he was a very tall man. And I looked, and I'm like, wow, that's Magic Johnson. Wow. And it's like, I think you will have a lot of stories like that going on this weekend because everyone's in town, and there'll be, you know, all the big parties and all the big fun. And, the, you know, Shaq is spinning uh, records. He's a DJ at some place one President's night. President's here. Former President Barack Obama's here. Yeah, Obama's the President. here. Common, the rapper. Chance, the rapper. Yeah. Kanye oh, West having out services. shoes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Con yeah. Kanye West is having his yeah. uh, Sunday service. Uh, as to the game, it's got some really weird uh, yeah. rules. I still can't understand. Can you can you, you make know, me understand this? I, I did not finish the degree in that because you <laughs> need one to understand the rule changes. Basically, they're going, they're playing like three quarters and then they will get to the final quarter and they will play to whoever has the most points plus 24, Kobe Bryant's right, number. Right. So if you're down 10, you'll need 34 to win the game before the other team can score 24. It, it is, I still don't they're get trying it. To, yeah, it's <laughs> silly. But it's, you know, I don't know if you've watched many N NBA All-Star games over the years. There's a really bad game. Because it's usually no like 150 to oh, 130. I forgot. I looked up the over-under and I forgot it now. But it's like 397. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy amount of points. And, and it's really, you know, they agree not to play defense. And it is, it's more of like a, every once in a while, spectacular play than actual you know, NBA basketball. The, the skills competitions are a ton of fun. You know, we have uh, Zach Levine taking part in the three-point shooting and contest. And that's the only bull taking part in anything Only bull weekend. doing anything, so that's a pity. Is but this, is this sort of like fun. the low point here for the Bulls franchise? Just in the last couple seasons, don't jinx yeah. it. no interest at all? Yeah, yeah, don't jinx it. It can get worse. Oh, nice. boy. Uh, listen, that, it is, unfortunately, you know, no one wants to hear it, and John Paxson has said it, repeatedly but they have been very beaten up and very injured and we haven't really seen the team they want to put on the floor and again I understand no one Which wants might to hear be it. like below average and, instead of really right, bad right but it is the the Eastern Conference of the NBA is pretty poor and you would think if they could be closer 
I mean, there are 19 games below 500 or something. If they could get closer to 500, they'd be a, a part of the mix. Sub-500 teams can make the playoffs. Look, the Bulls are in dire straits. They got one player worth watching. And because of all the injuries, it's, as we often joke at work, it's like punishment to have to watch it, you know? You have to leave your remote control by the television and sit down because otherwise you'd be changing it all the time. So. All right, well, let's let's move on to something more hopeful and optimistic. Sports fans are, are looking forward to April when the baseball season starts. Uh, for the Sox, uh, Luis Robert, Nick Madrigal, two big rookies. Are they going to make the opening day roster? Well, you know, uh, Robert will for sure because he's reached a contract agreement, so they gave him $50 million. He signed long-term. Madrigal... They, will, they might wait for the service time thing to kick in. This was the thing that Chris, that Chris Bryant, Bryant just had the in. grievance about. Now, I don't think service time matters for a guy like Madrigal. He's not a power hitter. So I would be a little bit surprised if they let that happen. I hope they just let that kid start from day one. If he proves he, he can win the job, they ought to let him do it because they're t trying out a couple of guys there that, that you wouldn't think have a long-term future. But the White Sox spent a ton of money, and they've improved a lot. You know, Pakoda came out. Out, and they, they do all this, you know, analysis of the numbers, and they have the White Sox with 83 wins, first winning season in like eight years, and they have the Cubs actually making the playoffs. With all right, that, wins. That, that's yeah. something to look forward to. We are out of time. Greg Pratt, A.D. Quigg, Megan Cripeau, Mike Mulligan, thank you all, and we'll see you on the next edition of the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Good evening. Does Chris Bryant start the year with the Chicago Cubs? Does he finish yeah, the year I, with the Cubs? I think he's reporting it. Did he report today? He's, he's supposed to report uh, this weekend, I, you know, look, I think they would like to trade him. They're not getting the kind of offers that they need to trade him. So I think that they would probably look more towards the trade deadline. You think there's lingering resentment there? Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.